All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Happy New Year. Those who don't know me, my name is Cesar Escalante. I am a Design Technology Manager for HOK here in San Francisco. And uh, I'm happy to be your host for uh, the first meeting of the year. Um, we are planning and working very hard to get to a very, very exciting agenda for the rest of the year. Just to give you a heads up, we have uh, speakers uh, already line up all up <coughs> to July. So, uh, and the topics that are coming up are really exciting, really nice. They're going to be announced uh, at the website. Um, if you are not aware of our website, it's uh, San Francisco, uh, SFDUG. Blogs, dot, blogspot.com and that's the best place to get the updates on what's going on with the group, the meetings, the topics, the schedule, everything. All right, so we have two uh, two topics uh, for this uh, this evening. Uh, the learning module is going to be led by Courtney Howard uh, and myself. We're going to talk about what we learned on Dynamo at Autodesk. Uh, University 2015 uh, and then we have our feature presentation by the work of uh, Dynamo Lab at CCA the top students projects this is a computational design group that Colin Macron is uh, the professor and uh, we are eager to see what they come up with um, so there are new Improvements at our blog website. Uh, we have now our resource pages, and uh, everyone in the group has been uh, consolidating what we know it's out there in the form of uh, learning blogs, uh, YouTube channels, uh, uh, forums, etc. So check it out. It's on the right side of our uh, blog web page. We welcome Jeremy Lovker of Perkinson Wheels. He, he joined us in December. That's in the back here. Um, he's doing a great job uh, giving us ideas on <coughs> how to improve uh, these meetings. And he's going to be the feature presenter next week. So uh, he's going to be talking about how to create families using Dynamo and bring them into a rapid environment. And we need you, more speakers, if you have ideas, working projects, want to present, uh, send us an email. We can put you on the schedule for August. Uh, thanks for IDA for the sponsorship of the food. Uh, they are uh, going to be providing us uh, with the munchies for the rest of the year. All right, let's uh, get started. Learning module, Autodesk University 2015. I, on Monday, there's um, a computational BIM workshop at uh, AU um, this year, and so I, I spent kind of the day with Colin, um, which is a little weird that I'm presenting this and Colin's in the room, but hey, let's, we'll go with it. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, so the computational BIM workshop, it, like I said, it was a full day. Um, my expect, I didn't really know what to expect actually from it. I, th I was thinking either it's going to be very basic or way over my head and it actually came in kind of right, <coughs> right at the mid-level. And so it was, a, it was a great workshop with a lot of, um, a lot of great people presenting, um, Colin being one of them. So there was split up into two sessions. I'll just go qu quickly through this, but the morning session, um, the workshop was so popular they broke it into two big rooms. So we, Colin and Ian were, was in uh, the one side and Zach was in another. And then the, the uh, afternoon session, people went back and forth. But it was really to kind of set the tone at the, the morning agenda was really introduction, kind of content, a little bit of structural framing. We'll go into a little more. But uh, in the afternoon, um, we had Andreas, Nate, Brian, Marcelo. So we really got into advanced uh, sessions there with a lot of different um, types of topics um, that we'll kind of go into just a little bit more. I want to, we have so much tonight to kind of go over, so this is going to really just be a very high level um, review of what the workshop was about. I thought one interesting thing, um, each person presented for an hour, so it was very quick to kind of show all the nodes, go through all the kind of complex things. 
And I found, and I just wanted to share this because I thought it, it kind of surprised me how well it worked, is you're sitting in a room with tons of uh, laptop or desktops, right? Everyone's going through it. People are presenting, the scripts are going so fast. And it, for me, it was really easy to just bring up one note on my screen, have Dynamo, have Revit, and have the speaker presenting, and be able to follow them, screenshot, make notes at the same time. So it was a really kind of amazing, like a month later, I was able to pull up my one note here and just copy paste everything into what I was gonna present to you guys today. So I just thought I'd share that a little bit. Um, first to kind of level set, we where to find the information, to, if you wanna dive into this a little more is, uh, the, there's a great um, material on package manager within Dynamo, and um, there is data sets from last uh, 2014 AU, there's tutorials. The 2015 um, package that I'll go through isn't up yet, but it should be soon. It's uh, The only reason is just size. I mean, there's a lot of great information in there, and so they're working to just um, break it down and get it up there. But uh, in the meantime, there's a lot of tutorials up there um, that you can find in the package manager. And then one thing that I didn't know that kind of came out of the, the presentation was this, I know the Dynamo primer, but I didn't know this kind of index of <laughs> nodes that really, I guess, kind of explains, provides a different additional information on all the nodes and how they're used. So it was a really great resource that was brought to my attention during the um, workshop. This is kind of all of the other packages that really were required to run a lot of the scripts. So we downloaded a lot of other um, third party packages to get these uh, nodes to work. So in the morning, again, like I said, it was a basic intro uh, of content. We did a little structural framing. It was more to just uh, get you familiar with different ways that you can use Dynamo. So for example, you know, different uh, types of lists that you can create from different ways to develop the, the code blocks, um, talking about lacing and how lacing works, and then taking kind of maybe a truss and applying it to kind of how Revit forms and uh, making complex geometry in Revit with your Dynamo trusses. So again, very um, high level. In the afternoon was when we got more um, specific on certain topics. So Nate Miller presented kind of working with tabular data. So you're reading and manipulating data from an Excel spreadsheet and really trying to uh, understand kind of interoperability, sorry, interoperability between Excel and Dynamo and Revit, which is, Excel is a very powerful tool. I think if you know how to slice the information, create pivot tables, summarize the data, and then um, pull it into Revit through Dynamo. So it was, um, Nate has this great passion for Excel, and it's, it's kind of amazing to kind of see what he can do in Excel and then how it gets filtered into Dynamo and Revit. Uh, the next, and stop if, I, if you have questions, again, I was, these are, to take seven, eight hours of a workshop and squeeze it into 10 minutes is, uh, is a little difficult, but, but um, the information will be posted up. Um, the, th the next was Andreas really talked about design scripting. And to me, this was something very, very new to, to what I understood in, in Dynamo, because I haven't Python script, I haven't worked with design scripting. And so this, to me, was the most exciting, because it's, it's explaining how design scripting can create nodes with just a text format. So for an example, this top, this top definition, you can build out of nodes. But then he broke each piece down to how that piece really could just be this in a code block. So by just typing text, you can get the same information that you would get from these nodes up here. And it, so this was a huge eye opener for me uh, personally. But to be able to break this down, so we took each color block section and wrote um, those nodes into a simple code block um, design script. And so we we're able to, he was very good at breaking it down and saying this is what this does in Dynamo and this is how you can write it with, Python, with scripting, with design scripting down here. And we came out with the same result. So that was something that I think I would enjoy maybe learning a little bit more. It's more, um, you're more writing code at this point, which is 
nice to see the, diff the how they relate with each other. We with Marcelo. Marcelo, I think, has always been about practical dynam practical Revit, and kind of using these using Dynamo to really build your skills slowly and build practical Revit workflows, which I think is. Um, uh, 60% of the people I run into are more interested in how can I do this quicker in Revit because Revit may not have the capabilities, but Dynamo opens up that, those capabilities um, within Revit. So simple things like creating grids with Dynamo, you think about that's a pretty easy thing to do in Revit, but to be able to um, space them out and manipulate them and in the future if you need to space them differently instead of doing that in Revit, you can go back to your Dynamo script and change one button, then your grids update automatically. So um, yes, it's an easy process in Revit, but it could be even more efficient using Dynamo. And then he gets into a little more um, sculptural things where going into family editor and being able to loft shapes more easy, more easier with Dynamo than you do with Revit, right? To be able to loft this was a very difficult thing, but with Dynamo took four nodes and we were lofted. Um, and then also kind of assigning materials through parameters and really understanding uh, kind of working with parameters within Revit and within Dynamo. Um, and finally, Brian uh, really presented on analysis and visual visualization and pulling information from outside sources. So this was pulling weather data to understand the optimal position in, of um, solar panels on a building. So basic solar analysis, solar driven design. So it was a way to um, study your facade by using weather data from you know what other, whatever source you're going to pull from, um, from a website. So it was a way to pull that information in from the third party website add color to it through um, some of the custom scripts that he has written and be able to visualize what panels are more optimal for um, solar radiation versus others. And uh, so working with color and working with um, different values from other third party sources. So you can see the, and that's, that was it <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, you could see that there was a, uh, really large range of topics that the workshop went through um, but I think that we because we stepped each we went through each part you really understood where to grab the information why it connected with um, each other how it connected with each other and why you were connecting this information and then you see the final product so they they uh, each person kind of stepped you through each um, piece of the puzzle so again it was uh, it was definitely worth it um, the material will be up on the package manager hopefully in a week or two weeks uh, but to go in there and just to dissect the information uh, it's easier for me to start with something that's already been created than to create it from scratch so this was just a little bit to kind of visually show you what each um, section was about and um, how to maybe pull pieces out and reuse them with what you're doing in your design. Is there any questions? Good. What were the presenters' names again from the workshop? Yeah, let me, oh, let me go back. So it was Colin was here, uh, was there Ian, oh, sorry, let me just run back. So we had Zach Crone, uh, Ian, Colin, Andreas, Nate, Brian, and Marcelo. And so this was the <coughs> second half. So uh, each one of these, I think each person brought a different uh, flair to, to the, the, each section of the workshop. Um, and you know they all have written their own scripts. They all have their own packages out there. And uh, what was great is the accessibility to, um, to each person and being able to email them or send them a message on Twitter and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on this, can you help me? And I think that's what's great about kind of their um, ability to take the time to help you, but also um, 
they're intrigued too, right? They want to figure it out. They want to try to help solve the problem. And so that was a, that was a really nice way to kind of get um, in front of them and talk to them. Yeah. The design screen from the node. Um, it was it was someone's session for AU that there is a node that you can convert nodes into design script in an automated process. Okay. Like you, you, the yeah. Way, the thing you described is that he was actually just showing and compare side like side by side, right? How they mm -hmm. actually translate it. Yeah. So uh, how this. We walked through, actually, he showed us this one, and then he, he walked through the typing. Actually, we typed out what we, right. what that would mean. Yeah, oh, so side sort of by side. Automated process, right? Typing it is going to always be superior to using the code to note. Code to note is just going to take line by line. All okay. your um, syntax is going to be based on the next line. It so breaks the, it down to T1, T2, sure. T3. And okay. Whereas in the, when you're typing properly, you can actually start to Dynamo will take the top level of the list, but when you start to use the definitions in to define a definition in the um, code, you can actually start to operate some, a little bit closer to what like Grasshopper would. Okay. You can, can consolidate it a little more. Is that yeah, correct so when you type using, it? Like a list map on something right. to do it, and like having to do that multiple times, you can actually start to just plug your inputs in and let it run on a definition, and it'll operate on like every point in that list. Okay. So it's a it's more streamlined when it's you can type it when you can type it in. So that what was the automated node called? Um, it was right click on a pack. Uh, yeah. Flip open and say code to node, and it's oh, gonna, see. the way it's going to organize the data is very similar to the way um, Dynamo will. Okay. So it will. It's not going to set up the the definition of the public yeah. definition. So is it safe to say people who are comfortable with Grasshopper and writing, typing in, things like that, this is, they could pick this up because it's a... Grasshopper's not going to be a prerequisite for it. Um, yeah, right. If you're more familiar with C Sharp or Python, you okay. might pick this up this, faster. But okay. a lot of this you can also find in the developer guide. Okay, um, that's good. A lot of the syntax, especially if you're interacting with web directly. Yeah, okay. Great. So... Um, I will pass it on and let Cesar start with the other classes. All right, I have to say that I was overwhelmed with the amount of information we received at AAU. I mean, there were uh, close to 30 classes on Dynamo Topics. Uh, you couldn't take them all, right? So I just was able to grasp, join whatever top uh, were, were available on the schedule. So I'm going to present those uh, a summary of those sessions that I attended to. Uh, but in general, I think in, in general the, the the main topic across all the presentation were all about the packages. I mean, they uh, each the big eye opener for me in all these different sessions was to know uh, how custom created uh, uh, packages resolve certain. Uh, certain problem, right? And out of those packages, I think there were four big topics. I mean, the big one, the big one was data interoperability. Uh, that's uh, topic number one. And Brian Ringley uh, presented uh, uh, how to utilize Dynamo and Rhino case studies. And he um, presented a survey of all the available tools and how they, uh, the workflow connect, currently connect to each other. Uh, you recognize of those symbols, they have Rabbit, Dynamo, uh, mm -hmm. Grasshopper, and uh, uh, Rhino. And uh, for the most part, if you see the historically, the, uh, the, the trend has been uh, to transfer geometrical data from Rhino into Rabbit, but then in their last uh, couple of years, with the come with the, with with, uh, with, with Dynamo now, the, the paradigm has shifted a little bit because now the data can be more streamlined back and forth between the two platforms. Uh, <coughs> so he walked us on how, it, what is the right process of exporting a Rhino uh, into uh, Revit utilizing Launchbox, the uh, package created by uh, uh, Miller. And uh, 
it's in a nutshell, it's just about uh, opening up uh, the uh, Rhino uh, information, translating the geometry into a mixed ball, you can call it like that, and then uh, retrieve that in a, a Dynamo format that can be then imported into Revit. And he gave us an example of uh, how to do that utilizing an actual project. So I think this was a residential tower in um, Australia and uh, the current shell, the envelope was a massing study done in, uh, in, in Rhino and everything else was done in, in Revit. And then these two platform meet at a middle point through, through Dynamo. And um, what was very interesting to me is to see how these uh, different sources of information meet at a common point. Uh, the part, this was a big uh, uh, workflow, but the part that I, I was mostly intrigued is where these two meet, because there's a line of uh, flow coming from uh, Rhino, and there's another one coming from Revit, and then there's a point at which the model lines coming from Rhino meet the levels uh, of uh, Revit and intersects to generate the floor plates. Uh, I thought that was pretty nice. Um, another thing that was uh, introduced to me, it's uh, uh, Elefront. I don't know if you heard of, about it. I think those who use uh, Grasshopper are more familiar than I do. But it's basically uh, a way to uh, better uh, streamline the information between uh, Grasshopper and Rhino and enable uh, Rhino objects to contain data and attributes. Uh, basically making Rhino a little bit more like Revit uh, in that it contains data. Um, I haven't played with it, but I, I thought it was something that uh, I would want to look uh, further into. Uh, and I think the the reason behind it is that uh, by enabling this kind of uh, attribute uh, uh, configuration, uh, the Rhino objects preserve their uh, user IDs and they don't get re regenerated every time, uh, which usually is uh, turned into data compromising. Uh, so um, this was an interesting uh, add-on for Grasshopper. Uh, and the other one, it's uh, the more recent developments uh, around Flux. Uh, so if you, you know, if you hear of, about Flux, is this uh, web-based, uh, cloud-based uh, technology that uh, storage information and enable it to connect uh, Grasshopper with, uh, with uh, Dynamo. And uh, in this, uh, he gave an, an example of a uh, seat in stadium in which the geometry was generated in using grasshopper definitions. The data then was populated and manipulated using flux. And then uh, uh, in that data included uh, uh, insertion points, uh, visibility uh, uh, measures, and all that <coughs> data flow is streamed back into uh, uh, Dynamo and Revit in uh, the form of data. So uh, Flux is something that it's uh, it's uh, recently new. Uh, we're actually looking into it and study the potential of utilizing as a way to storage data. Uh, so in the same line, Nathan Miller uh, provided us also with a presentation on the the nodes of his lunchbox package focus on data sets management. And his latest uh, release of uh, uh, lunchbox included the ability to export uh, and prepare data into XML and JSON, which actually expand the Dynamo ability to uh, communicate with other platforms, uh, especially HTML and uh, you know, web-based uh, platforms, uh, making a, a seamless connection to uh, things like Tableau and uh, Excel. And uh, a new tool that was introduced to me was uh, Power BI. Uh, I don't know if you heard of it, but uh, it's also a cloud-based uh, uh, technology that uh, uh, 
uh, reads the data and uh, enable us to ask questions to the model in a natural language. These are the so nodes. Power BI. Power BI. Uh, when the data set is loaded into Power BI, you can choose how to display the data with a powerful set of uh, nodes. And, uh, and uh, you can start interrogating the, the model the way using natural language, like what would be the, what's the gross square footage of the building? And it will, it will speed it to you. And uh, more recently, uh, this is Power BI. This is the data from the out-of-the-box uh, 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 Revit model. And uh, just by extracting the data from rooms, areas, and all those parameters, uh, uh, transfer into Power BI on the cloud, you can actually unlock the data and make it display or speak in a way that it's uh, more graphical and according <coughs> to architects and, and clients. Uh, this is the dashboard where you, where you ask questions. And as, as you ask questions, the responses are getting tracked uh, in the form of these little dashboards. And I was just uh, made aware that now it's integrated with Cortana, so that now you don't even have to, to, to type it. You can just talk to it. And uh, in a way, it's making the model talk to you, which I think that's a pretty nice idea. Uh, the second big topic I need to fly for, uh, it's, uh, it was all about practical dynamo, and Courtney already uh, uh, outlined a lot of these presenters. Uh, Nate Holland presented us with a set of four tutorials on practical design computation, a lot on visualization and utilizing color, which was a really nice addition on 2015 to the Dynamo uh, interface. Um, this ability to preview the geometry data in color and transfer that color also into Revit. Uh, and a lot of his presentation was about overriding graphic uh, representation of uh, elements using Dynamo, overriding field patterns, overriding colors. Uh, the second uh, tutorial he presented is how to group elements by family type. So I make this capture because this was a new node for me, the list group by key. What enabled me to do is, for example, in this case, select all the walls in the entire project <coughs> and then uh, break them, create list based on the family type. And it's very simple. And I think, if I'm not wrong, this is Colin's uh, node, right? Yes, I believe, yeah, I think. It's <laughs> Colin's package. What's your name of the package? Uh, ampersand, but it's, a, it's an out of the box. It's a real, it, it grew up, it's a real node. Oh, okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, the other one was this access to view, so that was pretty interesting. Um, this script enabled for the user to find what is the percentage of opening and accessibility to exterior views, utilizing uh, 3D uh, rays cast around the uh, point at a uh, eye level. Um, and uh, what enabled this type of analysis is these is a node called ray bounds by origin direction, which also was uh, something new to me. Uh, and uh, the potential for this is uh, it's really incredible. Uh, it utilizes vectors that are array around a point, and then tra you, you trace lines on each of the points. Another of this of his tutorial was to remember views and sheets, uh, utilizing scripts. Uh, what I like about this was this node, which is set built-in parameters, and this ability to actually get sheet viewports. I struggled for a long time trying to get that information. How, how do you read the viewport information? And here's the node by uh, uh, Nate Holland's uh, own package. It's called Holland Days. Um, <coughs> and the build, set built-in uh, uh, parameter by Archilab actually expands Dynamo ability to assign uh, property values to uh, parameters that are not visible. 
Marcelo, all about Marcelo was about practical dynamo. Uh, the tutorial I liked the most uh, was uh, this ability to project uh, property lines into a topo surface. Um, there was another one that uh, uh, built a structural framing based on an adaptive component uh, line based uh, uh, family. And this is his trademark. I mean, he's. Uh, uh, his, he, the documentation he provided at Autodesk uh, had a list of 19 different uh, uh, tutorials. They're available on the AU uh, website. If you download the, his, his handout, he have ac you will have access to all of this. It's, uh, it's pretty nice put together. Uh, the third big topic was uh, fabrication and manufacturing. Um, and Andrej Samsonowicz, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correct, uh, actually impressed me with this uh, workflow. And it uh, convinced me that Dynamo was, had the potential to model really detailed uh, geometry. I mean, by far, uh, I was seeing Dynamo as something that you use to uh, identify points and wireframe information that help and inform a Revit geometry, but this broke that myth. I mean, look at the level of detail for the automobile uh, industry. And uh, it was a huge, huge workflow. And it was a lab base, and we actually did it on class in one hour. So uh, kudos to him, because uh, it takes a lot of effort to put together a class and have 60 people go over this, um, this workflow. Um, it was pretty wild. Uh, but uh, what I like, uh, one of the notes I like the most was this, what's called the coordinates by cylinder uh, coordinates, which basically does what it says. It's established a cylindrical coordinate system, and that's what enabled him to establish these array patterns and associate vectors and points on a radial form. Uh, And the other thing I like about his workflow is that he built custom nodes to uh, uh, express uh, uh, geometry profiles with inputs that can be modified and customized. So one profile, which actually represents one of the openings in that uh, model, could, be could have different inputs and, uh, and uh, acquire multiple uh, uh, representations at the same time. And the last topic was all about optimization. And um, Dieter Vermuller uh, presented the topic Dynamo Design for Engineers. A really high level a script on the structural level, which uh, uh, had four components. Uh, exp uh, he demonstrated how we Utilize Dynamo to model, analyze, export information to uh, uh, optimization utilized in Excel, or utilizing uh, Optimo for genetic optimization. Uh, this is part of the modeling process. The structural analysis uh, package it's, uh, was made available and elaborated by Autodesk Labs. Uh, uh, the structural analysis tool enabled it to communicate with robot, uh, and the, the data can be exported uh, to analyze options and exported in Excel to come up with uh, best case scenarios. And then uh, there was a, lastly, there was a, a, a discussion of genetic optimization utilizing the optimal package, which was one of our first topics uh, uh, we discussed here. Um, finally, in the topic of uh, optimization, David Shear, he presented a topic about sustainable tools, but one of his topics was these uh, solar analysis tools, which uh, was also brought into the, uh, was also discussed during the Monday presentation. <coughs> so that's all I grabbed. Uh, I know there's a lot of topics that I didn't, uh, didn't attend. Um, 
All of them are available at Autodesk University. You can uh, watch them, download the information. And uh, what is really, really great is that the DIM files on most of them are available. So you can do your reverse engineer and uh, uh, play and learn that way. So any question? Um, so your very first example, the power role play, I actually have similar um, workflow that what doesn't really work is your, your full play comes just fine, but you can really maintain the relationship you, with your chef to clean. So what he had done, I, I also took the same class, what he had done is he broke that nesting into two pieces and create each full plate separate and just join them. Oh yeah. And he said that like, it was just a quick way to do it, but he, sh he was hoping to actually figure out a better way to do it. But I think it's really a problem with the sketch base graphic object that cannot really have opening. Um, that is like embedded in this full sketch coming from intersection. Right. right? So I mean, I would love to figure that out, like for my project or for anyone else who wants to do the same. <laughs> what was your solution? Um, well, I I had to just re um, recreate the floor and actually do the opening separate every after every transaction. Uh. You just do the opening separate. But his way is like more efficient, although he you have to join the floor into one object. Yeah. yeah. I know the spring package now has an, uh, a node called a sketch, sketch line reader or something like that. It actually extracts sketch lines uh, and enable you to modify a sketch line, which is fantastic. So that's, that's in the latest release, uh, mm -hmm. really good. Uh, comments, other questions? All right. so. Let's open the stage for our future speakers. Uh, let's uh, bring CCA Fault here. That's Danita, Trenton, and Anbo. class in just a brief summary. Oh yeah, so um, so these guys are the sort of, they, they had the really, really great final project. So this was a, a, as a result of a class um, that I co-taught with another colleague from Autodesk, uh, Patrick Tierney, this last semester at CCA. Um, and the, the title of the class was BIM Experiments, but it, um, it was CCA's looking for another way to teach um, Revit without being so restrictive or normal, I guess. So um, so we tried to find a way to teach Revit, but also with Dynamo at the same time. And there have been a few classes along these lines, too, at some other universities, notably like Georgia Tech, um, uh, a couple at MIT. Um, I think I'm sure I'm missing some, too, but uh, one at Stanford recently as well. Experience. Um, there was there were 16 students in the class, and there were about two that were relatively familiar with Revit. I would say about four to six that knew enough about Grasshopper to be dangerous. They're all MR students. There were uh, there were 12 under um, 12 undergrads and four MR. I feel like no, these guys probably know Grasshopper. <laughs> I only know enough that I'm going to interest myself, so. <coughs> okay, um, hi, my name is Anne, and this is Danita, and this is Trenton. And uh, we are students from CCA. Uh, today we're going to present, like, um, the final project that we have from the intro to Dynamo and Revit. And um, uh, it's an open-ended assignment that we can do whatever we want, creating whatever we want using Dynamo and Revit. And we are making... Um, uh, pavilion, 
So for our, um, <coughs> our project, we took a dilapidated site that was adjacent to our school, as you can see in orange, which we, um, so like Alma was saying, we <laughs> were required to only use uh, Dynamo and BIM, and so basically starting out the project, we created a generic curvy surface in Rhino that we then brought into um, Dynamo and used throughout the project to used to define the structural components, the parametric roof surfaces, and the pretty much the program at large. And then we import it to Webit, and then later on we use Webit to um, analysis the lighting, and then uh, putting the program that's fitting into the lighting analysis that we had, and then uh, creating the final products. And, and this is the Dynamo script that we use. Uh, so uh, why not we're going to go into Dynamo and then creating this whole thing again and break mm -hmm. it down in how we use it. Uh, so from the start, we're going to use the uh, import web uh, model that we're creating before and um, transfer into um, um, Dynamo surface. And and regretting that Rhino model that we had. So basically, right now, we're using the Rhino plugin and Right now, Danita is getting the Rhino file, and then we're getting the Rhino file, selecting just the model, and then turning it into Dynamo objects that will then turn into um, a NURB surface that Dynamo can then read. And then yeah. that's so far that we're talking about. Okay. And then. Um, for the next step, we're gonna use the what we call adaptive component. So we use the surface that we had, and then uh, putting um, the um, the component panel into the surface. So this is um, basically a diagram of what our root component was. It was a very we didn't want to overcomplicate it. It was really simple. It was basically just a box with a piece of glass inside to allow light. And then can you open the and show. And then we made the panel in Revit as an adaptive component and can you just pull the tab up to show how it moves. There. So it's able to um, modify itself and move along the curvy surface. In the the inside is like just defined glass. Mm -hmm. The inside is just we defined it as a glass material. That's fine. So once we saved that as a family type in Revit, we were then able to import it in Dynamo and place it upon the surface. Lunchbox. And we also used the lunchbox that he talked earlier to um, break it down into a, a grid a pattern. Yeah. And then as that is like that's four points that we're gonna use the panels and define um, how this panel gonna work. Adaptive component. So this is the component we use to block that adaptive component into Dynamo and as the family type. So we save it at a family type. That's just reading the family type. And, uh, that's a close book. Yes. And then to get um, variation within the porosity of the panels, we used a vector dot product component that allowed us to take a surface normal at any face along the surface, and then it was able to measure um, a certain amount of deviation between the surface normal. And then we then took out the absolute value so we didn't get any negatives, because the negative number would equal, would create a negative opening, which doesn't make sense. And then we were able to limit the opening to a defined um, amount, which we defined as 
point six and point eight units. Yeah, right there. Okay, we can go back to the slide. So that's like um, what I'm talking about with the dot product. There, the red is the normal, and then the blue is the deviation that the panel would go along the surface. So what the dot product is doing is basically finding all the points between when it would line up along the red and be perpendicular to the red, and then finding those points. And then the absolute value is taking um, only the positive sets of numbers. And then the um, math three map range is just allowing us to limit between our max and min of what we want for the openings to be. Is it working? It's so slow. It's a little slow. I want to see a demo without it. <laughs> uh, so after that, we're just going to output it to Webit and uh, creating the just system that below it. So this is basically just a, a screenshot of the trust component that we used. Um, we took a lunchbox space frame component and were able to, within that code block, set the um, the U and V value, then along with the depth that we wanted the truss to go, and then that allowed us to get each individual line that we then took out and were able to basically pipe it and then export that into Revit to create our structure system. And that's now. Just too free. <laughs> Which we would love to show you. <laughs> we believe it on WebEx. It usually takes all your resources. <laughs> we can come back to that. Just go to, uh, Let's just go to, to the lighting analysis. <laughs> okay. So then. Once we were able to get it into Revit, we were um, able to run a lighting analysis on the inside parametric group that we have on the inside. So this is a, just a floor that have the roof on top, and then how the, um, the roof is affecting the lighting below the floor. And then uh, right after that, we create the, the program that we have before, and then plug it in, in um, the space that we think is need more out uh, lighting or need less lighting inside. And, uh, and run the analysis again, and it's come out with a different result yeah, as how the wall is blocking the sun coming inside. And um, and after that, we was creating columns and walls and then furniture um, and then curtain wall. So, and then we run the analysis inside a space that's seeing the light that getting um, the shadow and then the light that from the rooftop that creating in the below. So that would be the space inside that uh, analysis just now without even the direct sunlight. So this is like an overcast, typical San Francisco weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the arc works. Yeah. When we did it, we were doing it um, at the same time when a lot of students around the U.S. were doing it, so it took a really long time. Mm -hmm. But generally, depending on how complex the model is, I think we ran it again a few days later, and it only took about 
10 minutes to do. Mm -hmm. It was very quick. But at that time, it, it took about an hour. Was there any going back and forth between, um, so you created the form, applied this geometry to it, and did an analysis, and then was there any tweaking of it? Um, or what did you want to no, take we, you that far? Well, we, we set out basically with the idea that we're going to make this just generic curvy surface, and then we're going to run a lighting analysis and determine how the program can best fit within it. Okay. So we were yeah. really at in the beginning that, that this was is, the, yeah. yeah. This was the set, you, the set form, and then you can move the program around yeah. to fit to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you want, I mean, is that an interest to kind of try to take the form, run the analysis, and then be able to tweak it into Rhino? Because it seems like yeah. that's what's happening right now, is that interoperability between Dynamo and Rhino, and, Rhino and kind mm -hmm. of being able to move back and forth. Yeah. It seems a lot of people are interested in getting that workflow. Yeah, I mean, the the openings in the, in the panels themselves are determined basically on the, the surface normals mm -hmm. on that surface. So if we were to have gone in and changed it, we could have really fine-tuned the like the lighting analysis that we wanted. But yeah. we were we were more interested in just trying to learn Dynamo. And, right, right, yeah. 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 So your but yeah, your problem statement was different yeah. at the time, yes. yeah. But definitely, yeah, you could go back and, yeah. and update it. Be able to go back and forth. No, we're just going to do the just with like the surface offset. So is this the, um, the just lines being projected on the surface right now before the adaptive components? Are well, right now it's um because Lunchbox is, basic, is breaking it up into a series of panels okay. that we're then able to bring the family type in and then set our adaptive points onto the, onto that. Onto the grid. Yeah. I think after the, the script is done, then technically if we're going to change the form of the Y in, in Rhino, we can just update that mm -hmm. where the file is, and I think everything is should be changed. Yeah, because you're just yeah. pulling in, at that front part, you're just pulling in the form. Yeah. You know? yeah. So like. I don't think you want to live stream. I've been doing this back and forth for lately, and I don't have to start at the point yet where the, it's a, you know, it, it, would, it bogs down when you start getting Yeah, you want to, so you're saying set set a form, run it, yeah. change it, set it, run it. One of the new things that's going to come out with 9.1 is going to be you can freeze a node. So you can, like, it's an option to, like, stop execution at a point. So, like, before you would, like, make all these changes to thousands of adaptive components at the same time. You can do that. So if you continue to do the code yeah. blocks, you can use your code yeah. blocks and then curve and just break the connections. <laughs> right. And do that. Yeah, this way you don't have to remember where the wire goes. Oh God! Well, um, there's there are other bugs too. It's not you know, <laughs> nine one isn't out yet. There there are other things done. I'm not sure what this is. Manual. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. <coughs> So uh, we divided the class into thirds, and roughly in every the end of each third had like a project. And so the first third was um, just Revit, no Dynamo, just just kind of like make a house, going through how to navigate a, an existing model, then sort of building up pieces by piece by piece type thing. The second project really fairly closely resembled that tower in Australia, which I thought was very funny. Um, <laughs> Right, so it's like you know, um, looking at sort of Rhino interoperability and using Dynamo as a translation between CAD and BIM, and then the third was the final project, and it was um, it was pretty much a free for all. Um, it was the, there were some projects that resembled buildings, and there were other projects that were fractals. Um, the only requirement was that it dealt with Revit. In fact, Dynamo wasn't even a requirement there. Um, Did you have students? 
I would say most didn't have any trouble. You, you can feel free to, to you know, add it to um, A lot of us came <coughs> with a basic understanding of Grasshopper, I think. But other than that, and that was only from basically the same class that we took, but it was a Grasshopper class, and that was about a year a year prior to this. Yeah, Andrew got us with DT9. So what would be an advice for someone to bridge the gap between you no know, knowledge of scripting and Rhino, Grasshopper, right. to because I feel like there's a very high level language spoken here, there's an understanding of nodes and packages, but what about for someone who doesn't have that understanding? Yeah, actually, uh, at least when, in my role as the technical evangelist for, for Dynamo Product Desk, I, I, I tend mostly to deal with people who have never seen us before. I've actually got somebody on my team that worked on very complex thing. I have a background grasshopper, and he doesn't, and he, I'd say he's well up there doing some very complex problems in, I'd say, three, four months. My, I mean, my, my answer to how to start, though, too, is that you need a project. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard, at least for me personally, to decide that I need to care about something if I don't know why I'm doing that. So um, that's the, I, I try to motivate it that way. Um, you know, here's, here's this thing, the end result should look, you know, something like this, or, or rip on a theme, you know, um, and then sort of, you know, if somebody wants to do something that you're doing more than you already have read it, that's a really good grasshopper or dynamo. Try to do something that you know you can already do manually and try to speed it up. It should mm -hmm. take you about 10, 15 nodes, maybe at the most, but it's, it's something small that you can achieve and you can build on that. We have some other educators in the room too. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm also thinking about um, like communicating the logic amongst people, and even like um, you know, the project manager might not want to get into the depths of like how the script is working, but wants to understand the logic at a higher level and kind of what's going on. I wonder, could you guys pull up the kind of what you think is the visualization that could best communicate the logic of what you built? To say the museum director is going to come in and try to understand what the heck you're talking about. That would be the program diagram. Or something like that. If they, you know, I just think that's the other side of the question. Is, um, <coughs> I guess this one because it, um, it's just taking the information that we get from Dynamo and then trying to translate the the usage of our program and where the program's gonna get placed within the data that we got out of it. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Um, I, was, I, was, I was expecting and hoping to see some kind of a, a process graph or a dynamo graph that's annotated in some way, like um, a generate um, uh, uh, a little prototype and then replicate it across this frame daylight analysis, is there some kind of high level view of your graph that you organize the nodes in some way? Like how can you explain in English the logic behind <coughs> That probably. That's, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 English. <coughs> in English. <laughs> <coughs> it's close. Um, you know, I mean, the unfortunately adaptive component yeah. 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 yeah, that helps. That does? Yeah. yeah. You have to be a rabbit user. Yeah. <coughs> but there's, there's, there's also maybe a level of annotation that does talk at the. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess that might be good. I think this is just breaking down like where you can change a certain things, like changing the Rhino uh, surface, or you can change the trust um, system, like how deep it is, how high it is, how, how many. Of them, then you need it to. Do. So yeah. that's what the script is for. Yeah, like how how does a certain people access this graph? What information is important that's going into it? Like which decision maker is it? Um, control which pieces of this that we need to resolve. Yeah, I think that's what's interesting about um, how you could use something that you guys have put together. Is what you're saying is. You're, if you're in front of the client or you know, the, the 
person who's funding the uh, pavilion, then you there's an interaction that can happen and say, you know, maybe those those you know square things they want it to be bigger or, or smaller or more of them, and and to be able to interact and slide some or kind of enter in your numbers or do a slider or somehow kind of show that that uh, information can be manipulated live in front of them. I think that becomes more of um, it lets that uh, that person feel like they're involved in the design of their you know, pavilion or you know their architecture, which I think is a really powerful thing that the visual scripting can do. It's kind of Absolutely. help more people get involved into in, into design. There's a new web-based output that you can do from Dino. What the name of it is? Reach. Reach. Where you can allow you can basically send a link to a client and see their best with the sliders. With sliders and then kind of get into that. Yeah, I think that's that's a even though this is very complicated yeah. to understand <laughs> and, and get behind, but um, I think it makes it, it a little more accessible if you set it up, cor you know, correctly. If you set it up, it could be accessible to a lot more people um, who can manipulate it. You were doing something else that was really interesting. Um, it was just building the graph um, as you were talking, which is, a, I mean, it'd be really interesting to develop that skill really well. I'm sure you're doing that teaching to be able to like explain the graph by building it and showing how yeah. it goes. Through. So we in like Grasshopper, we can use this as a, a slider, mm -hmm. but like Dynamo allow it to just like type it that copy it there, so script it. So that's what we're using here for. So we can technically change the number, and that would just change the geometries or the charts. Mm -hmm. Right. We do it in one right. on the grid. Yeah. Yeah, but you're ab still able to quickly manipulate mm -hmm. the information, right? And mm -hmm. to kind of get a. a a result that they can see instantaneously instead yeah. of let me go back for two weeks and redesign and then I'll sh we come back to you. Um, I think it's a, a little more accessible. I think we're all still sort of pointing out the difference between the old methodology of you know someone drawing something and the methodology of us creating the process mm -hmm. and, and still having to explain that to most people. We're not designing a solution for you, we're designing the process that you can interact with. Mm -hmm. I think there's still that split between everybody in this room who's used to design the process and people who think of you know, the architecture as the, the napkin sketch, which is the, the final design solution. So I think, I think that is often between those two yeah. groups of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and another thing when you're, it's really important to have that high level uh, view of it while you're working from day one, um, because it's not just client facing, it's also being able to turn around to your team of Know, five people that you're working with or other teams on the project and say, this is what we're doing in a high level. You don't need to get into that type of a thing, but you need to be able to have something to present and have deliverables at like the end of the week. That's, it's necessary in order to take this into a firm setting. Yeah, and that's what it seemed like, you know, when I was asking questions, you're, you, you said, well, the vision was this, you know, and that's what we work towards. And that's kind of nice, like you're saying, they, you knew what you wanted you wanted to just take that form and apply, you know, adaptive components to it. Not to be able to manipulate the form. You wanted to take it, do the solar analysis on it, and then manipulate the program around it. So you had a very clear vision of what you wanted to do with it. And that's and to your point. Nicely, so they then could come back in right. and start to have a feedback loop yeah. if you needed to. Yeah. You just replace that first chunk of code with something else. Mm -hmm. And then also highlights uh, something very important that at the end of the day, what, it, what, we, what we try to achieve is uh, to deliver a, a solution to a design problem. It's not to pretend the tools that we are using. Right? So it's a design that we, we try to respond using the tools for problems and not vice versa. So we're not using the tools to create and never and, 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 and and I think, uh, but you know, in this in, in this kind of setting, we are interested in, in, in the tool part of that, and, uh, and uh, in the clicks and clicks and, and how we can best uh, improve our knowledge of, of the tool. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it was, it's, it's all about the product. 
So is this going to find your, I don't know much about CCA, but is this going to find its way into like your studio projects or anything? Yes, definitely. Yeah, we, <laughs> we have, um, what do they call it, integrated building technology, which are our IBD studios, which are really um, hands-on and take a, a lot more um, in-depth view of structure and how things are going to work. And it's doing something, we usually use a lot of Grasshopper and Rhino, but I think now that we know how to import our Rhino models into Dynamo and then transit them into Revit, it'll make our um, workflow a lot more efficient and we'll be able to get um, a better quality drawings out of it. Also the part that like you can do analysis on Revit, so beside this can be weather analysis, like lighting analysis or solar analysis that is helping the process, uh, the process of designing the project. Mm -hmm. The other thing is too is you can start drawing really in the semester. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're not yeah. Yeah, definitely. Did you generate working drawings <laughs> out of your project too? Was that part of your kind of final presentation beyond like the rendering since you have some yeah, we planimetric or elevation or other? We did. We did. Um, we did. We have them on the computer. <laughs> we weren't going to put them on the, on the slide <laughs> show, but yes, we did do them. That was part of the requirement. Yeah. <laughs> These guys had five weeks total to do it too, and that was overlapping with studio finals. So we promote it on the desk. No. <laughs> um, I don't know. I I feel like we kind of came in with it because we already knew, like I said, we already had um, taken a grasshopper class, so we kind of had a little bit of a foundation for um, visual scripting. So I think that even though it's a different software, it still kind of helped us a little bit. But I mean, I wouldn't say that it was easy. And it made it didn't. We still spent a lot of time learning and everything, but. I'm kind of curious about the, the teaming aspect because your studio projects are usually you're on your own, right? You're on the edge, just trying to get it done. <clears throat> but in this case, the three of you are working together collaboratively. How did you guys collaborate using this technology in that kind of environment? Um, Revit have the things when two people are working on the same project um, on different computer, they, it would sync, and then one person make a change, then the other one would ultimately update it. So I think that's was a part that made it easier for us to work with each other. So you guys were using work sharing on your on your project. Yeah. Well, you're already more prepared than half the people coming uh, into the workforce. So. That's great. But how? Um, sorry to go. I guess this is more the teaching methods of how uh, you guys collaborated on actually developing the scripts. Was it was it more of um, you would go and each try to test your own and then come back and share so or would you work on it together? I would say we, we work on each other together. Yeah. Together, script, together yes. on one. Because yeah. Yeah. it wasn't that easy to just right. test it out. Yeah. So we got yeah. into a lot of trouble and then yeah. we test it again okay. with each other. So, yeah. Yeah. And help from the professors. Right. They, I think um, these guys at least talking to you halfway through the process, I think um, we talked about you also taking Sort of modular chunks of this, like you had a, you had somebody who was working on the space frame, and and the panels, and somebody else was just trying to figure out how to work daylighting and credit, and somebody else who was trying to put furniture there. Yeah. Yeah. Your strategy was so. What's that? Your strategy. I had a class with Charles and Mister Abdul yesterday. So what we did, we divided up based on our skills. Hmm. So like in our group, we were uh, from a structural engineer. Architects like energy and a space uh, design and whatnot. 
From the visual and descriptive perspective, uh, I was as close to this uh, Arcadia uh, hackathon where I think it was Luke Bannon who came out with a new winner and they were able to actually split the script and talking and utilizing plus. I thought it was pretty, pretty amazing. And what that means is that you can actually separate pieces of the script and assign it to different uh, person while uh, aggregating it into the same uh, definition. Uh, I, I haven't tested, but it would be something that I'm looking for. Uh, have, you, have, have you seen something? Um, actually, I think that was pretty, that was like a dream team. There was somebody <laughs> on that team from, it was a Dynamo developer, there was uh, Andrew Human, obviously very good Grasshopper, and there was also somebody from Flux on that same, on one <laughs> team. That's, <laughs> not, that's not true, I was in the room. <coughs> that's not true? Oh, I was not there, so. Uh, it was Dan Stewart, and the guy, I can't remember his name, from Front Peak, Jason Hong and the two of them together. So we gave them a Flux account, but they used Andrew Human's. Uh, component which can turn across all script into XML. Oh, cool, yeah. And then send the XML to Flux to a virtual computer on the Amazon web server, unpack it, run it at the speed of light on a, you know, a data center, and then send the result back for visualization. So, yeah. Cool. But they, they were like, yeah, they were just like, fantastic. <laughs> that, that alleviates the processing time that takes from, from generating like, the results. I mean, this was a simple, and you look at uh, how many minutes they have to wait. Yeah. And it's yeah. something that is really, really deep. This is uh, looking at the little yes. circle. A lot is happening in a lot of fields, like we saw uh, rendering being uploaded to a server, and I think more and more of these things can be uploaded to server. It's, it's just the way things can be coming. Okay, so Second thing, the next uh, presentation, uh, we're going to feature Perkins and Wills uh, in the topic on creating families, and that's going to be the second Wednesday of February. So stay tuned uh, for the next one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.